Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Tonight, concern the coronavirus is entering a new phase in Canada, circulating in the community. From mass transit to public gatherings. We need to start changing our approach. And why some doctors say if you're sick, don't go to the ER. Right now, I'm just waiting to hug it. That's all. A teen boy rescued after he was abducted, taken as collateral for a stepbrother's drug debt. The tragic consequences of domestic violence. And he never left her alone. He never left her alone. And potential solutions. I think it kept me alive. Yes, I do. The circle of support that some say is saving lives. Canadian hockey's first Olympic champions might surprise you. And this was an underdog story that ended up being a momentous Canadian story. A new tribute for a history-making team. This is The National. In an epidemic, fear can easily outrun facts. A day after we learned of the first COVID-19 case in Canada with no direct link to travel, the fear is the virus is rampant everywhere in the community. The facts say the experts, not here, not now. Health officials are acting as disease detectives, tracking cases of the virus, isolating those who have come in contact with it, hoping to head off a wider spread. The risk official stress remains low, though yesterday's case in BC of apparent community transmission is a sign the clock is ticking. For the most part, Canada is still dealing with individual cases or small clusters linked to travel from outside the country. And yet, Vicodopia has the story of one case in Ontario that shows how challenging containment can be. After returning from Las Vegas for three days this week, the man took the transit with rush hour crowds to and from work until he showed up at a Toronto hospital on Wednesday. The individual identified that they had the onset of cough, a mild cough, and that's the primary symptom. The man, who's in his 40s, is now recovering at home. Health officials say the risk to passengers is low, but they're now tracing who the man might have had contact with. Where he picked up the coronavirus isn't clear. Las Vegas doesn't have a known outbreak. Officials predict it's only a matter of time until the virus will be passed on locally. Should we uh, find ourselves and, uh, in a circumstance where we're seeing hmm, there's local transmission, we need to start changing our approach then. The TTC is already doing that, disinfecting vehicles more frequently. As for passengers... I'm not very concerned. Like, it's sad for those who are getting affected by it, um, but I don't think we need to do a world panic. And every time, even when traveling home, like, you're wondering, like, if the person sitting close to me is infected. Security guard had it, and, uh, yeah, that was whack, but he, he handled it properly. He went, iso isolated himself and all that. If Toronto continues to see unexplained cases, it could change the definition of who's at risk and who should be tested or even retested. And I know that in other jurisdictions, they've gone ahead and tested individuals who are, for example, ill with severe respiratory infections. So it might be now looking for the virus in cases that did not have clear exposure. Dr. Mubaraka is among the scientists tapping into $27 million in new federal research money to study how long this coronavirus survives in the air and on surfaces, a key unknown for officials trying to prevent more transmissions. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. BC is home to Canada's first apparent case of so-called community transmission. But as Greg Rasmussen explains, the province, like Ontario, remains focused on tracking and containing the virus. But it's not ruling out taking more extreme measures. Today, BC unveiled its plan to fight the outbreak. It's a very challenging virus to, um, to be able to contain, and we've seen that globally. So far, the province has 21 confirmed cases, including one patient in intensive care. One case in particular is troubling because so far, it can't be traced back to any of the earlier infections. It has officials scrambling, tracking the woman's history, looking for the source. And that investigation is obviously one that we're watching very carefully, and there's been a lot of uh, um, detailed disease detective work being done in the last 24 hours. Across the border in Washington state, three new deaths were confirmed, bringing the total to 14. After a staff member tested positive, this university told its 46,000 students and staff to stay home. Classes and exams will now be done remotely. 
So many people are staying home in Seattle, commute times have been cut in half. In Vancouver, some things are going ahead as 70,000 fans and players from 16 countries converge on BC Place Stadium for the World Rugby Sevens. This ticket reseller says some people are staying away. It looks like the local numbers are coming. Uh, we have no issues there. It's just that a lot of international groups have cancelled. A growing number of events are being put on hold, including a large hospital fundraiser. We were getting um, increasing feedback from both um, guests and volunteers about their concern. The B.C. government says it's preparing for things to get worse, setting up a new task force. We live in an interdependent world, as all of you know, and there are aspects of this that we simply do not and cannot control, and that's why we have to be prepared. If and only if things get considerably worse, the government could invoke its powers to restrict travel, ensure there's food on store shelves, and reallocate health care resources. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. So what should you do if you think you're infected with COVID-19? Your first impulse might be to rush to the nearest emergency ward. David Common shows us why some doctors say that's a bad idea. In extreme cases, those with COVID-19 would end up like this. But unless you're this sick, many physicians don't want you anywhere near a hospital. Because COVID-19 sparks a fear of I'm going to die or this is something really serious, they become alarmed and they want to be reassured and so they show up at our department. The problem with that is that they put others at risk. Emergency doctor Lori Mazurek even started a petition urging authorities to set up off-site testing. I think there's 1,444, which I suppose is not bad for less than three days, but uh, I think it would be amazing if Canada signed it and all the people of Canada said, hey, you know what, we want to protect these people. Something she believes should already be in place now, so those with mild symptoms are kept away from those most vulnerable. There are limited efforts now to have the testing done elsewhere. Toronto's Michael Guerin Hospital is setting up a dedicated clinic. So if yeah. they're worried just about COVID-19 and they just need to get screened, we're helping, working with our family health team and community partners across the street uh, yeah. to go and get tested. So it's an off-site location. That's the idea. Testing can happen there. That's right. That the new facility set to test up to 150 people a day is the only one announced so far in Ontario. The province says planning for more could be in place for next week. This hospital believes the timing is right. There has uh, been very limited uh, number of cases in Ontario right now, so to have built these a month ago wouldn't have made sense in terms of the need in the community. As we start to see uh, the number of cases increase in Ontario, we want to really be prepared in case there is further growth. So why not just have a family physician conduct this test? Well, in part because the test involves putting a Q-tip all the way up your nose and that can prompt some people to cough. If they are infected, that could be a problem to the person administering the test who now likely needs to wear not just a mask, but a face shield, something many family physicians just don't have on hand. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. If you start having those flu-like symptoms of COVID-19, Health Canada says to isolate yourself right away. Then you should call a healthcare professional or the public health authority where you live. Now, in most provinces, dialing 811 does the trick. But Manitoba, Ontario and Nunavut have other toll-free numbers. Before you go to a doctor or clinic, call ahead and ask for instructions. It's always nice to get information from infectious disease specialists like Dr. Srinivas Murthy. He's a co-chair of the World Health Organization's Clinical Research Committee for this new virus. You're a doctor as well, of course, at Children's Hospital here in Vancouver. And, and Dr. Murthy, let's start with this. The risk of transmission in Canada remains low. What does that mean? That's correct. Uh, what it means is that when you go out to school or to your place of work, your risk of getting this disease is low. Um, there have been community level transmissions reported, but they are isolated. Um, just one reported thus far in Canada. You know, I think that might come as a surprise to some people that that low uh, risk because we had, as you say, a, a transmission within the community here in British Columbia, two and a half hours away in, in Seattle, Washington. They're dealing with an outbreak. How can it be that the, the risk of transmission is still low in this country? 
I think a few things. I think first, our ability to test in Canada is excellent. And so if you have symptoms and if you have concerns, you will be tested at most hospitals in Canada. Second, our institutional experience with outbreaks from our experience with SARS has led to a lot of preparedness work being in place. And third, everyone feels comfortable going to their doctor without having to worry about paying anything. And so I think familiarity with the health system has led to a sort of an engaged public health infrastructure. I think that a lot of people may be concerned that the virus is lurking out there in Canada and that maybe in a matter of days or weeks we'll see a huge jump in the number of cases. What's your view on that? That's definitely possible. Um, hopefully not. And we will see how these next days and weeks go. I think Canadians should feel confident in the people who are monitoring their health and their hospitals to be ready for this. All right. Dr. Murthy, thank you very much. Tonight, at least 230 Canadians must be wishing they had made different travel plans. They're among the 3,500 passengers forced to stay on a cruise ship off the California coast because a former passenger died from COVID-19. Erin Collins is in San Francisco with today's discouraging development. It's not a cruise anyone would sign up for. Stuck at sea for an anxious wait, followed by medical tests with bad results. Among those tested... 46 persons were swabbed, uh, 21 uh, of those on the ship tested positive for the coronavirus. Paratroopers dropped off the test kits yesterday. This ship singled out after it emerged that California's first COVID-19 fatality had been a passenger in February. And today, fresh worries that a second former passenger may have died on land and that others are seriously ill. So the rush to find and test former passengers is happening across California. We are planning to contact all people who got off the ship who are residents of San Francisco. Um, and we'll get back to, pe with people, to those people to inform them that if they should consult with their health care provider. Back on that ship, the positive results mean their journey is far from over. It's kind of a little bit disturbing being out here in the open seas, just, you know, barely pushing along. We're just going in circles. Um, and not knowing how long we're going to be out here. But those answers should be coming soon. We have developed a plan which will be implemented this weekend to bring the ship into a non-commercial port. One major obstacle to that has been a shortage of testing kits and labs, something the U.S. president says is a thing of the past. But he seems less sure that the people on board the Grand Princess should be let off the ship at all. I mean, frankly, uh, if it were up to me, I would be inclined to say leave everybody on the ship for a period of time and you use the ship as your base. But a lot of people would rather do it a different way. They'd ra rather quarantine people in the land. For now, the thousands on board the Grand Princess are still out there somewhere. Officials say they'll all eventually be tested for COVID-19, but what's less clear is where their crews will finally end. Aaron Collins, CBC News, San Francisco. As you're about to see, the best part of quarantine is when it's over. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> Thank you guys! <laughs> this Ontario woman hadn't seen her dogs in 66 days. She was one of more than 100 Canadians who spent two weeks in quarantine on the Diamond Princess after a coronavirus outbreak. When the government flew them back to Canada, they had to spend another 14 days in quarantine, even though they'd never tested positive. Some of them have criticized the government's caution, saying they would have preferred to be in isolation on their own at home. To Washington now, after taking fire from critics who say his administration was slow to act on COVID-19, Donald Trump went before cameras to reassure the public. Katie Simpson shows us how that went. Wearing a ball cap with his re-election slogan, the president toured the Centers for Disease Control. We're prepared for anything. We're prepared. We are really very highly prepared for anything. It's a visit that comes after his close advisors downplayed the spread of the coronavirus. What I am pleased to report is that the 14 deaths so far that are completely tragic and very sad in this country um, shows that this has been contained because the president took action. We don't actually know uh, what the magnitude of the virus is going to be, although frankly so far it looks relatively contained. In fact, the number of coronavirus cases is on the rise in the U.S., with more than 288 people diagnosed with the illness so far. 
That includes two attendees of the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee conference in Washington this week, which drew high-profile politicians, including former Prime Minister Stephen Harper and Vice President Mike Pence, who reacted today with surprise. Well, uh, let me say that's the first I've heard of it. The head of the CDC, who stood beside the president, did not appear as confident about containment as officials from the White House. You know, I still believe uh, containment and control is the goal. Um, but that's going to be complemented strategically, but this nation should not give up on containment. In what turned out to be a remarkable conversation with the press, Trump admitted he has little knowledge about certain public health issues. I didn't know people died from the flu. And he attacked the governor of Washington state for criticizing the administration's handling of the outbreak. Well, I told Mike not to be complimentary to the governor because that governor is a snake. The U.S. is ramping up production of coronavirus tests, aiming to have 4 million kits available by the end of next week. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. And amid all this, yet another sudden White House staff shuffle. Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney is out, replaced by close Trump ally Mark Meadows. Trump announced this evening on Twitter, Mulvaney will now become U.S. Special Envoy to Northern Ireland. Meadows announced last year that he would not seek re-election to Congress. He will be Trump's fourth chief of staff. Here in Canada, after a two-day ordeal, a 14-year-old Toronto boy abducted on his way to school has been found safe. Police believe he was taken as an act of retribution for his stepbrother's drug debt. As Ali Chiasson explains, those who know the boy feared the worst. Right now I'm just waiting to hug him. That's all. The boy's neighborhood is breathing a collective sigh of relief today. He was missing for almost 40 hours before his alleged abductors dropped him off at a barn in a rural area north of Toronto. Police found him traumatized, but alive. And my gosh, everybody was jumping. I was crying, everybody was crying, was rejoicing, just happy. He appeared to be disheveled at that time, was taken to a medical facility for a checkup. Um, he's now safe with his mom and dad. Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders says this is far from over. There are people out there that definitely know what went on. According to investigators, the boy was taken as collateral for his older stepbrother's drug debt. They allege he owes high-level cocaine traffickers $4 million and skipped town. I mean, normally organizations would go directly after the person they're looking for, and usually you stay away from children. Marcel Wilson speaks from experience. I'm a former gang member, gang leader. Back in the 90s, he was affiliated with a Toronto sect of the Bloods. He turned his life around now and advocates for safer streets. Mm -hmm. I just think this is a prime example of why not to get involved in this type of lifestyle. Did you think he was going to be found alive? No. Um, we definitely, from my lived experience and things that I've lived through in the past, I was actually shocked because of the, the risks now of what he knows and what he saw. Chief Saunders says the boy will be protected. He probably will be the most watched young man in the city of Toronto right now, so you'd be more than a fool to try to apprehend him. Meanwhile, back at home. People are beyond relieved. Like, the relief is the first thing. Relief that he's safe, relief that he's back, relief that we don't have to have a funeral. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Ahead of International Women's Day, the Ontario government announced today $307 million to fight human trafficking. We're putting the traffickers on notice and we're taking a decisive action to crack down on this heinous crime. Enough is enough. Of the $307 million announced today, $202 million is new money. The majority of it will go towards survivor supports. Another chunk will go towards law enforcement and a new public awareness campaign. Domestic violence has become a crisis in Canada, and this week, the Nationals taking a closer look at how to stop it. Tonight, the killing of Crystal Tracy. Okay, who is the person that won't leave? <laughs> My ex. How the system failed her and the lessons to be learned. Two years ago, this cancer patient was planning his funeral. Now he's planning to run across Lake Winnipeg. It's so inviting. Look at me, skate on me. Celebrating the Winnipeg Falcons, how a 1920 band of brothers brought home Olympic gold for Canada. We're back in two.
One of the world's largest film, music and tech festivals has been cancelled due to coronavirus. South by Southwest was supposed to get underway in Austin, Texas one week from today. As Lekanathu explains, it's just another hit for the entertainment industry. But now is not the time to panic. Now is the time to prepare. That was the message from the city of Austin, not willing to take the risk at South by Southwest. When we have events where it's close personal person contact, like concerts and those sorts of festival type of settings, we expect people are going to be together for an extended period of time, which increases that threat. The long running event attracts hundreds of thousands of people, but this year Twitter, Facebook, Netflix and Apple, among others, pulled out. This Toronto producer was supposed to premiere a documentary series there opening night. The loss is that we don't have that exposure and that we may not be able to meet some of the connections that we would have met, which could have turned into other television shows. The cancellation is just part of a huge hit to the entertainment world. With thousands of theatres in China closed, major films are moving release dates. Take the new James Bond film. Its premiere has been pushed to November from April. And that's not all. Sony Pictures has temporarily closed three of its European offices. Disney Plus cancelled a major launch event in London. And the music business is reacting too. Singers like Canada's Avril Lavigne are pulling out of Asian tour dates. Even K-pop sensation BTS nixed hometown performances in Seoul. South by Southwest is one of Austin's biggest money makers, bringing in over $300 million. This radio DJ says the ripple effects will hurt. There's going to be a lot of folks who are going to lose their employment or lose whatever money that they would have made during South by Southwest just in that two week period that they were counting on. And other major events around the world are also now at risk, including the famed Cannes Film Festival scheduled for May. Zulay Kanathu, CBC News, Los Angeles. Here are some of the other stories we're watching across Canada tonight. Toronto police have arrested five people following a string of armed robberies in the city's West End. Officials say the crime spree started in Etobicoke, where three pharmacies were robbed by four teenage boys, all allegedly wearing ski masks and armed with guns. Not long after, a nearby mall was evacuated as another robbery was underway. Again, four teens wearing masks were said to be involved. However, at this point, police don't believe this one is connected to the other three. Hundreds gathered today for the funeral of Océane Boyer. The Quebec teen was found dead along the side of a road last week. Family and friends fought back tears as they remembered the 13-year-old as a compassionate and energetic force. The man accused of her murder was described as a friend of the family. He's detained and awaiting trial. And the hockey world is mourning one of its all-time greats tonight. Known as the Pocket Rocket, Henri was the younger brother of legendary Maurice the Rocket Richard. The Montreal Canadiens, uh, Canadian was a star in his own right, though, winning 11 Stanley Cups, the most ever won by a player. The 84-year-old died today after a long battle with Alzheimer's. After the break, we're turning to our special series on stopping domestic violence. Tonight, a story behind the statistics. How did she explain the black eye? She did. The killing of Crystal Tracy. What happens when the system fails? And PEI's unique approach to protecting victims of domestic violence, it's called the circle of safety. Why it's working. Tonight we continue our special series, Stopping Domestic Violence. A problem shockingly widespread and underreported. For months, CBC News and Radio Canada examined domestic violence in cities across Canada. We found a crisis shelter system so overwhelmed and understaffed, it turns away tens of thousands of victims a month. We also examined how police and government respond to the crisis or try to, all with a special focus on intervention and prevention. Now we examine how toxic relationships can reinforce patterns of abuse and can end up devastating entire families. Crystal Ann Tracy was killed by her common-law husband after she left him less than two years ago. Adrian met with her surviving sisters to explore her tragic and all-too-familiar story. 
and a warning, you'll hear some strong language. It was the morning of Christmas Eve, which happened to be Crystal Ann Tracy's birthday. It was also the day of her murder. 11 a.m., she's in the St. Stephen, New Brunswick apartment she's rented to get away from her abusive ex, Irving Hasty. He'd been her common-law spouse for more than 30 years, the father of her three kids. The turkey is in the fridge, presents not quite wrapped. Better things were supposed to be ahead. 911, where's your emergency? No point at the 11.16 a.m., a 911 call. Hasty, who's supposed to stay away, has shown up. Okay, who is the person that won't leave? <sighs> My ex. Crystal sounds fed up, but not yet scared. I, I don't want any harm done to him. I just okay. want to go. No problem. He's brought this knife inscribed with Love Ma. Go! Just leave! Hang up! Oh, be quiet. Midway through the call, something happens. She starts yelling for him to get out. Hello? Hello? Crystal? Her sisters, Valerie Tubbs and Marilyn Little, seem to have almost memorized every horrible sound in that call and think they sense what she was thinking throughout. She really loved him. Mm -hmm. From the from the get go, and still, yeah, right to the end. Right to the end. You listen to the nine one one call, and that's what she says. Please don't hurt. Him. Come get him. But please don't hurt him. You listen to the nine one one. And then him in the background yelling, "I fucking had it. This is fucking it. I'm fucking sick of this." And mm -hmm. then the phone went dead. Police were there by eleven twenty two. Crystal was conscious, but had been stabbed multiple times. By 11.43, she was dead. And as wrenching and ruinous as that was, what makes it worse is what went through the minds of her sisters when police showed up with the news. And when I opened the door and come out, he said, is Crystal Tracy your sister? And I said, yes. And he said, I'm sorry to inform you that she's gone, right? And I just looked at him and I said, he did it, didn't he? Crystal Ann Tracy's hometown of St. Stephen is a place where secrets don't stay secret for long. Barely 4,500 people live here on the shores of the St. Croix River. It was pretty common knowledge that she and Irving had been together since she was 17 and he was the serious older boyfriend here at her graduation. How on earth did it ever get to murder decades later? To hear her sisters describe it, if you didn't know what was happening behind closed doors, you'd never be able to tell their baby sister was in trouble. She was one to jump in, and I said, she always had a laugh. She always, yeah, right. She was I think just. A lot of times, people didn't know because she she always looked like that when she saw you. Yep. Happy. Yep. She always had a smile yep. and a story. Yep. And a... Not long after meeting, back in the 80s, Crystal and Irving moved into a trailer together. Almost right away, the sisters say, red flags. She just up there cleaning, and then she eventually had to look at me, and she had a great big black eye. And I just went, really? And then I, all I saw was this, this head go by the window very fast. He comes barging in, because he didn't know who it was. Mm -hmm. So he figured it was that guy in there with her. So he was jealous right from day one. Jealous? Oh. <sighs> How did she explain the black eye? She didn't. Life moved on. The couple stayed together and had three kids. It was hard. Crystal had problems with alcohol. So it seems did Irving. He had two charges of impaired driving. The first official intervention by authorities we could find is in 2009 one of at least five contacts to come over the years with the Department of Social Development for alleged domestic violence. Each time, the case was closed without any action. Maybe. The sisters say they kept encouraging her to leave and saw Crystal almost hollowing out. She just looked like a... Well, she didn't look like my sister anymore. No. Um, she looked old and 
tired and just she just wanted to give up, but she she never did. Yeah, yeah she took. She took back her life. Yeah, and he didn't like it. In the spring of 2018, 35 years after the relationship started, Crystal left. She got a ground level bachelor apartment on the main street in town. You sound very proud of her for making that call. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was very proud of her for leaving finally. And I told her that, and I said, Crystal, I have. I don't have a good feeling about this. I said, just keep, just watch yourself. Yep. Because and he you never left her alone. No. Never left her alone. She did try, started keeping a diary, noting times she said Irving was following, watching, harassing her, showing up uninvited. Threatened to do himself in, she writes on July 28th. August 4th, I went into my apartment. He was at the window. That night, she writes, he showed up again at midnight. Sometimes several entries a day for a month, including one about a break-in while she was asleep on the couch. He tore the screen off and she woke up to him leaning down, like this close, saying her name. And what did that moment change? That he, to me, was he wasn't going to let her go. Yeah. If he couldn't have her, no one was going to have her. There will be women in Canada who recognize a pattern. In Ontario, where statistics are vigorously compiled for domestic homicides, there are key warning signs. 71% of perpetrators had a history of domestic violence. 46% showed signs of obsessive behavior. And there were previous threats to die by suicide in 44% of domestic homicide cases. Irving Hasty, according to Crystal's sisters, had done all these things and authorities knew it. Crystal writes in that diary about contacting the RCMP. The night he broke in, her sisters say she went to get a protective order to keep him away by law. Was the protective order uh, a good thing or not a good thing? She didn't think it was a good thing because, like I said, the harassment, the, the, the calls. It's just a piece the... of paper. She's not, she wasn't stupid. She knew. Yeah. Did she regret it? Yes, she regretted. She regretted. Leaving was important, but her sisters believe it didn't protect her. Statistically, it is the most dangerous moment in an abusive relationship. Of hundreds of intimate partner homicides in Ontario, reviewed from 2003 to 2017, 67% involved a couple with an actual or pending separation. To the claims of Crystal sisters that there were decades of violence leading up to this, some close to Irving Hasty deny it. So does he in his pre-sentencing report. Ultimately, Irving was convicted of manslaughter, sentenced to 10 years. With time served, he'll be eligible for parole in less than three. And then it was a final insult when <laughs> I was told that he'll be out in two years and seven months, and you took my sister's life. So, I mean, where's the justice, right? Of the more than 80 people in Canada killed by a partner or former partner in 2018, Crystal Ann Tracy murdered on Christmas Eve was not the last. Just as the horror of intimate partner violence goes on and on, it was only three days later that the final homicide of the year was recorded in Canada. Another family asking, how did it get to murder? And while Adrian's story is in many ways one of failed systems and safeguards, progress is being made to curb domestic violence. When we come back, how Prince Edward Island hasn't had a domestic homicide since 2015. The program turning entire communities into protective shields to save lives. That's next. This week, our series Stopping Domestic Violence has explored the challenges victims face even when they are able to get help, like access to a shelter. Now, some encouraging progress in Prince Edward Island. It hasn't seen a domestic homicide in half a decade. Sally Pitt explains how a bold provincial program could be part of the reason why. Anna? Yes. Hi, I'm Kelly. Hi, Hi nice to meet you. These two women were almost killed by their former partners. 
and this is the woman they credit with helping them stay alive. Today, they're walking with others who want to see an end to domestic violence. And how are you doing, Anna? <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> affirm the important part we all play in the elimination of family violence. Hannah Povey and Kelly McCauley were both part of Circles of Safety, a program unique to PEI. It's for women at a high risk of being killed by their exes. To always have that ongoing concern of not knowing whether I should be looking over my shoulder or not knowing whether I should be taking different routes every time I walk someplace in town. It really sucks. I have to consider those safety measures. My name is Hannah Povey, and I am a survivor of domestic violence. The Circle of Safety asks the woman what she needs to feel safe, not what others think she needs. Then it brings together people in her life who can help make that happen. Today, it's her current boyfriend, a co-worker, and Gloria. What are you worried about? Gloria Dennis is a support worker with Family Violence Prevention. I'm worried that even with electronic monitoring, he may end up going to stores that he knows I frequent and trying to look for me. To outside eyes, her boyfriend Will seemed perfect, but at home, he was a very different person. I was in trouble and I was in danger. Gloria asked me a question. Ooh. The question was, did I feel safe in any room of my home? And I only paused for a moment and responded back and said, no, I don't feel safe. Hannah had a safety plan when she first left Will. He's in jail now, but three months into a two-year sentence, He's applied for release. So she's bringing her circle together for a second time. Her plan could also include police and victim services. I had received a phone call from victim services. Will has applied for parole. I was really taken aback hearing about him having parole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she hadn't had much time to really recover. It's not your job alone. Everybody can take a piece of this. Concerns your safety. Having them ask me questions about what I wanted was a huge difference to how I had lived for the last year and a half. The control that was taken from me, I'm slowly regaining. My name is Kelly McCauley. I was in an abusive relationship for 20 years and survived. She'd left a dozen times, but always went back. He kicked in the bathroom door and uh, grabbed me by the hair and threw me up against the washer. Once I heard him getting a gun from under the bed, I really thought I was going to die. Four years after I left, my husband ended up killing his girlfriend. He was found guilty of second-degree murder. He appealed and got manslaughter. That was in 2015. It was the last domestic homicide on Prince Edward Island. And I got a second chance. I was one of the first uh, persons to do the circle of safety. I can remember them all sitting around the table. And I was thinking, oh my god, all these people, look, they're all here for me. I think it kept me alive. Yes, I do. Absolutely. Now the idea is spreading. Gloria is working with shelters in three other provinces so they can set up their own safety circles. Well, it brings the circles of safety to other communities. It would be great to see that being utilized across the country. I, sometimes I say it's kind of like my baby. <laughs> I, I really think that if we work collaboratively, then we're going to come up with better solutions. I think I'm a stronger person. I have a voice now. Um, I'm not scared to say anything anymore. It feels good to have someone to hold that understands. Sally Pitt, CBC News, Charlottetown. If you need help and are in immediate danger, call 911. To find assistance in your area, you can go online. Visit cbc.ca slash stopping domestic violence.
endingviolencecanada.org or sheltersafe.ca. Coming up, a change in direction. We'll dip back in history to celebrate the Winnipeg Falcons. And this was an underdog story that ended up being a momentous Canadian story. How this 1920s team beat the odds to win Canada's first Olympic gold medal in hockey. And why Manitobans today are cheering them on. It is a stunning underdog story that remains impressive a century later. In 1920, the Winnipeg Falcons defied the odds and racism to become Canadian hockey's first ever Olympic champions. An accomplishment that will be honoured this weekend on the ice of Lake Winnipeg. Cameron McIntosh takes us there. So this was the original team uh, back in 1920. It's, uh, Looking back in time. Wonderful. So that was the full team right that there. That was the full team right there. The 1920 Winnipeg Falcons. Canada's first Olympic hockey team, hockey's first Olympic champions. So this is your rink here, right? Yes. Kim Malchuk is obsessed with the history. It's so inviting. Look at me, skate on me. <laughs> <laughs> to mark the centennial, she's organizing a tribute pond hockey game here as part of Gimli's annual Icelandic themed ice festival. What does this mean to the community? If you pick up the Interlake news, um, telephone book, all these names, that were the eight men that went to play in 1920. Those names are still here. Yeah. It's still woven in our culture. Discriminated against for their Icelandic heritage, the Falcons couldn't find a league that would accept them. Bunch of Icelandic boys, nobody wanted around. Until 1920. Just back from the First World War, they became unlikely Canadian amateur champions. Then, Olympic champions. And this was an underdog story that ended up being a momentous Canadian, well, world story. While it was the Winnipeg Falcons, most of the players either descended from or had strong ties here to Gimli. Now, 100 years on, it's the descendants of those players that have been keeping the Falcons story alive. That's him right there. Halder Slim Halderson was Steve Perkins' grandfather. That's the medal. What do people say when you show them this? They're amazed. It, it just fascinates me, this whole thing, and, and they, uh, they swept through this tournament. He's dropping the puck Saturday. You know the recognition that uh, most of the Icelandic community felt that they never got. We did these. In replicas of the Falcons' original blue and green sweaters, four teams are hitting the ice for a few thousand festival goers. The adversity and the discrimination, I mean, it, it's such a great story to share. Bringing the past back to life in respect and celebration. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Gimli, Manitoba. Turns out Lake Winnipeg is going to be seeing a lot of action this weekend. As if fighting cancer wasn't grueling enough, Chris Eastfeld is planning a cool way to mark the end of his treatments. Our moment is next. Two years ago, Manitoba's Chris Eastfeld thought his life was over. Diagnosed with stage four melanoma, he started planning his funeral. Now, not even Manitoba's fearsome winter can keep him down. Eastfeld's treatment wasn't just successful, it gave him his joy for life back. Today, he's nearly tumor free, and tomorrow, he and an old buddy will race across frozen Lake Winnipeg to celebrate. And that is our moment. I didn't think I was gonna live. When you actually prepare yourself to die and then survive, yeah, you wake up and everything's different. Now I'm feeling fantastic. I'm, I'm extremely active again. Yeah, I decided after seeing a post um, from a good high school friend who had gone out for a run in Winnipeg um, in minus 50 temperatures, I took one look at that picture and as a joke said, I'll race you across the lake. He kind of responded, ha ha, you know, that sounds like a good idea. And then a week later, I'm like, why don't we? You know, training every day, I've probably run 700 kilometers in the last six months in preparation for this race. It has changed me as a person for sure. You know, there are side effects from the treatment, which I just fight through. It's, it's not like I have all the answers at this point, but I'm certainly excited about figuring it out. But I'm happy I'm living and I just push through. 
When he got the bad news from the doctor, when things were at their worst, the news was so bad the doctor burst into tears. But as you can see, things uh, have changed dramatically, and uh, it's nice to finish this week with a story of hope. That is a national for this Friday, March the 6th. Good night.